Hello everyone and welcome to The Story Dragon and today's spoiler free review of Paladin's Grace by T. Kingfisher. Better yet, a double hello to all my subscribers. If you want to double hello in the next video, subscribe now and leave a like and comment. The tagline for this book is, when a god dies, who gets left behind? I was pitched this book as an exploration of a man's faith. Of the duality that a paladin is simply a crazed berserker that is considered good because he does it for God. Obviously, the person suggesting this book to me screwed me over. This is not that book, but this concept does get touched upon, so how does it not become a morose and depressing read when several years ago our main character basically slaughtered the majority of his friends and a bunch of civilians? As a writer, that's an interesting question. Right? In this day and age of grimdark popularity, how can you have a character that has done unspeakable things, but not have it be a dark novel? Because, make no mistake, this is a light and fluffy fantasy romance. Emphasis on the romance, definitely. Something I almost always try to avoid. I don't like romance in my fantasy. But do I like fantasy in my romance? Well, I don't like romance either, so... I actually read Paladin's Grace about a month after it came out, so this isn't a review of something I just finished like normal. No, this is a review of a book that I liked so much, it was the first book I openly recommended to people that aren't book people in a very long time. I wanted to review this book now because my last two reviews were largely negative, so I wanted to prove that I do actually like books and reading. Anyway, I grade to a baker's dozen, obviously, as everyone does, and this is an easy 11. Why not 12 or 13? Well, I'll get into that later. For those of you unaware, T. Kingfisher is the nom du plom of Ursula Vernon. Now, I haven't read any books from Ursula, but am becoming very familiar with Kingfisher, so I can't say much more to that point. Some of you may be familiar with the generally well-regarded sword heart, from Kingfisher, and so you know this takes place in the same world and even has a few crossover characters. However, it works as a standalone novel, no need to really consider it part of a universe or anything like that. I will add that I hear if you didn't like Sword Heart, this is more of the same, kind of, so you won't like this either. Me? Well, Sword Heart is now next to my TBR, so... We open on our main character. A paladin in the service of the Saint of Steel, Stephen. I've got to be honest, this name does not inspire me to great things. It seems a tremendously unfantasy name, in fact. Where are all the romantic leads with real fantasy names like Urgluak the Conqueror? But anyway, let's, let's not dwell. In a few pages of background exposition, we find out that this god of steel has died, and without the blessing of their god, these paladins have lost the ability to pull themselves out of the berserker frenzy that they fall into when in battle. Stephen and his paladin friends were given refuge by the Temple of the White Rat, a group of priest lawyers in the city the book takes place in, Archenhold. Or Archenhold? I'll go with the C, Arch, Archenhold. The White Rat asks nothing of them, but as the Paladins are still coming to terms with their loss years later, they have tasked themselves with providing protection for the White Rat's temple and the people within. Stephen is asked to protect one of the temple's priests as he goes into the slums. It's at this point we meet our female protagonist, Grace. It's the classic mute-cute story we've heard a thousand times before. She's being chased by a group of priests from the Temple of the Hanged Mother who want to kill her for stealing some plants, and knowing how fanatically pure these priests are and how much they hate sex, she runs into Stephen and insists that they must stop pretending to have sex to stop the Hanged Mother priest from following her as they wouldn't look close enough to the heinous act to see that Grace was the person they were chasing. Meet cute indeed. Over the next few chapters, we have our plots become distinct, along with their subplots. We have the mystery of the decapitating murderer. Cool. The assassination attempt of the city's leader. The romance between Stephen and Grace. And Grace's impressive parfumeray skills. With the subplots of Grace's traumatic past and relationships, and Stephen's knitting. Also, the third mystery of the pumpkin spice latte perfume. 
These are the themes of Paladin's Grace. As this is definitely a romance book, it's really the will they won't they between Stephen and Grace that pushes everything forwards and all of the surrounding matter is just for flavour and, you know, the occasional distraction from pining. In reality, there are two characters that can actually be discussed here. Stephen and Grace, the two main characters. Don't get me wrong, I loved basically all of the side characters, but I can't really say much about them. Just know that Stephen's fellow paladin and kind of sidekick paladin, if you will, is life and Grace's landlady is a hoot and I'm a little bit in love with Archbishop Beartongue of the Temple of the White Rat there. But let's start with Grace as she is definitely the main character. Don't get me wrong, it's a very close thing between her and Stephen, but she is the main character, as far as we can all tell. She is an obsessive perfumer that has buried herself in work for the majority of her life, using it to escape bad relationships of all kinds, whether they be abusive teachers or abusive husbands. Either way, they are men and abusive. After escaping these, she's made a name for herself as being pretty good at what she does. For me, Grace is a bit of a duality. I like her as someone to follow and read the dialogue of, but her go-to descriptions of relating everything to smells and perfumes and bass notes and aftertones... I have, I ha I have zero interest in these things. Like, not even remotely. A touch damning, I realise, from the perspective of connecting to a character, and I have to admit I tuned out a lot when this stuff came up. I'm sure it was written well, but I, I didn't really care. The perfume thing really is my only negative of this book though, so that is the like one negative I have about this book done. Everything else is glowing praise. So unfortunately though, I, it means I didn't, I didn't build any real connection for Grace throughout the book, but luckily, this was countered by Stephen. Stephen and his incredibly unfantasy name. I love Stephen, it turns out. I pretty much just want a book about Stephen and his fellow paladins guarding the bishop, Beartongue. Now look, Kingfisher herself describes this book as fluffy romance, so there's a lot of the paladin story we simply don't get that I would have loved, but the book didn't suffer for not including them. Would I have liked more exploration on the effects of a god's death on its followers? Yes. Of course, I'm here for that. I have a thing for the wise and world-weary bitter character. I'm into it. How about exploring the idea that paladins are no better than thugs and berserkers, except for the fact that they follow a god? I have time for that. But that's not fluffy romance. In fact, it was very interesting how Kingfisher took these rather devastating things that have happened to the paladins and still kept the story light. Anyway, Stephen, right, he knits socks and feels he's too tortured a soul to have a relationship despite most certainly wanting one. He's a grizzled veteran and straight up killer that doesn't know how to ask a girl out and acts like a dumb teenager around Grace. As the whole adults being as socially inept as teenagers when it comes to romance is pretty well trod ground, I was fine with it. You know, it's, it's a trope. Some people... Like it, some people will hear that and instantly say, this isn't for me. Fine. For f me? More Stephen and pals, please. Well, Stephen, obviously. I mean, I've just said that. I also liked close platonic male friendships. The kind of men that can cry without shame in front of each other and say, I love you, to each other. We need more of these, and we need to be secure enough to stop calling them bromances. That said, yeah, we, ne we need more bromances. The dialogue. Just in general, the dialogue between characters was really good. Kingfisher was able to show tension, familiarity, or humour between characters whenever she wanted. And I'll go into this a little bit more, a little bit later. Paladins as raging battle maniacs. Now, obviously, this theme didn't really get explored, as I've mentioned, but as a concept, I really like it. I'll read an exploration of paladin morality any day. Like, is anything a paladin does inherently good? Because they are good, so how can they do bad? Does doing something bad strip a paladin of their powers? Or they're good, so it's never bad? 
I'm into it. That's all. I'm, I'm into that. A world of black and white morality where grey is forced into it? Yeah. Now, we didn't get that in this book, uh, as mentioned, because it asked the question, but then moved on to fluffy romance. So actually, I mean, a question to you. Does that exist? Paladin morality tales? That sounds really fun. Okay, so my absolute one favourite thing, my prime favourite. The first time Stephen and two of his paladin buddies are escorting Bishop Beartongue in the royal court. Honestly, like, genuinely just the banter between the four of them pretty much won me over for the rest of the book. I'm an emotional husk of a man and so rarely genuinely laugh at a book, but this scene got me. Uh, it, it, it was amazing. It was just very funny and left me wanting more, possibly too much, as I only really wanted to read more banter for the rest of the book. Maybe it was too good. In the cover section, I like to talk about alternate covers or the awesome fantasy art on the front and how evocative it is or is not. Paladin's Grace, however, only has a single cover and it's not fantasy art. It's fine. It's neutral to me. It doesn't turn me away from the book, but it also doesn't attract me to it. I suspect it was done this way so that it didn't attract specifically a fantasy crowd and could be marketed more generically, perhaps. Keeping in mind that I don't typically like romances and when I'm reading fantasy I don't like romance in my fantasy, this book makes me have to question if I like fantasy in romances. I mean I don't, but there is some blend there that I like. I really enjoyed reading Paladin's Grace. I want more of it. Specifically, I want more of the Paladins. They are bae. Anyway, this has been the Story Dragon and I hope you've had a good day and continue to have a good day. And if you are one of the 11% that have made it to the end of the video, thank you to YouTube Analytics for letting me know that. A triple hello. Goodbye.